there are two things monitored when we use electronic fetal monitoring. One is uterine activity, and what you'll see is a tracing of the uterine um, contractions. And this is either done with a tocodynamometer, which is a sensor of the tension of the skin of the abdomen over the uterus, or with an intrauterine pressure catheter. And what you'll get is these variably smooth contractions. If it's a toco, all it tells you is where the contraction is. The height is actually not accurate with a toco dynamometer. The location of these in time is, is also important. The other thing that is monitored is the fetal heart rate. And there are three things, several things that are important about the fetal heart rate. One is the baseline, and that should be 120, 110 to 160 beats per minute. The uh, next thing is there should be some variability. The heart rate should not be um, a straight line. It should vary with little tiny changes all over, and that variability should normally be between 6 and 25 beats per minute if you look at at the top and the bottom here. We don't usually actually quantify that, we just sort of visually look at it and we want to see it as a jiggly line. The rationale behind variability being important is that it's the interplay of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and that one of the first things to go with hypoxia would be that those would go to sleep. The next thing is to look at the rate itself, and you would like to see accelerations. Accelerations are abrupt increases in the heart rate that come back down to baseline. Presence of accelerations is extremely reassuring, as is presence of normal variability. Then come the more worrisome uh, fetal heart rate traces. And so the first is an early. So you have your heart rate coming along like this and then it dips down subtly and back up. It approximately lines up here with the contraction, with the nadir here approximating the peak here, and this one is called an early. Early deceleration because it occurs early with the contraction. The cause of an early is head compression and these are not ominous. They are a normal finding and do not cause any major concerns. More concerning is a late. So in a late, the heart rate's coming along and it starts to dip down and it lasts past the end of the contraction. So if you see the contraction end here, it's still going on and the nadir of it is past where the contraction peaks. This is a late, and this is from uteroplacental insufficiency. And there are several things that can cause lates, but if you think about uteroplacental insufficiency, you should be able to think of them. So if there's a bunch of contractions all occurring very close together, tachycystole, then you don't have enough time for uterine perfusion and you can start having lates. If there's maternal hypotension, like from our epidural, then there's not enough uterine perfusion pressure and you can get late decelerations. If mom becomes hypoxic for some reason um, or decreased oxygen carrying capacity, then you can also have these late decelerations. If they're accompanied by a flat trace, no beat to beat variability, then this is worrisome and does correlate with fetal acidosis. The third kind of tracing that we think about is variables. So these are an abrupt drop, abrupt recovery. They can occur anywhere in a contraction. Um, they're often shaped like a V or a U, so abrupt, unlike a late and an early, which have this gradual change. These are abrupt. Um, and this one is called a variable. And you can remember that by the, 
the V. Shaped like a V. Uh, the cause of this is often blamed on cord compression. Very rarely do we actually find a piece of cord, um, but it is some acute cause of decreased perfusion to the baby. The last pattern to talk about is called the sinusoidal pattern. And what that is is exactly what it sounds like. The heart rate varies in what looks like a sinusoid like this, so it looks a little like a contraction pattern. It, uh, the frequency here is three to five per minute. And um, there is no beat to beat variability. That is also very ominous, um, often due to fetal anemia or hypoxia or infection but can also be caused by opioids, by narcotics. Um, but it does get people excited. It's a pretty rare form. So recently the obstetricians have gotten together and decided to create classifications. So there are now three classifications of these uh, waveforms, um, traces. So category one is normal. Everything looks good. In order to be category one, it has to have baseline that's in the normal range. It has to have the presence of variability. You'd like to see some accelerations and no decelerations. Category three is the most worrisome and that requires no variability and the presence of either late or variables, repetitive lates or repetitive variables and no variability, or a sinusoidal pattern. So it's no short-term variability plus lates or variables or sinusoidal. Either of those becomes a category three. So what happens if they call it a category three? Well, the assumption then is, is that the baby is acidotic and something needs to be done. So the options for treating a baby when you think it may be acidotic, and there are several things that we can do in that situation. And those include, so Rx, you can give mom oxygen. Now if she's already 100% saturated, giving her supplemental oxygen is not likely to dramatically raise the fetal PO2, but it's good to do and, and may, may make a difference, and it certainly looks good medical legally. Um, we can increase mom's blood pressure, particularly if she just had an epidural and she's a little bit hypotensive. We can change the maternal position, um, especially if she's on her back. We can get the baby off of the vena cava and the aorta to improve perfusion. If she's on Pitocin, we can discontinue it so that we reduce contractions. If she's not contracting, then there's improved perfusion to the uterus. Um, we can actually stop contractions by giving um, terbutaline, again, to just reduce the, the lowering of perfusion caused by uterine contractions. Um, they can give an amnio infusion and that is the insertion of fluid into the uterine cavity to reduce any cord compression. If none of this works and we've gone quite a while with the, one of those class three tracings, then we go to C-section or if she's close to delivery and she's complete and they can do a vacuum extraction, they may choose that. Additional tests that can be done if you, we're not quite sure, uh, there's not much. Um, scalp stimulation, so that is um, Usually just the obstetrician places their finger up into the vagina and scratches the baby's scalp. And if there is an acceleration in response to that, then the baby's pH is at least 7.2 and they are not acidotic. Uh, another thing we used to do was called fetal scalp sampling. And that was uh, scratching the baby's scalp and using a capillary tube to obtain a little bit of blood and then taking that to the stat lab and getting a blood gas run on it. Um, you can imagine that environment is not really optimal for obtaining a, a clean sample. Um, putting a glass tube uh, in that environment is not optimal either. And um, the labs are actually not 
Um, well, not all that many places can run a blood gas off of a capillary tube. So fetal scalp sampling is rarely done, but it would give you a snapshot. We would draw three samples, send them to the lab, and if they got below uh, 7.2, we'd start to get worried. Below 7.0, we would certainly go to stat section. Um, again, rarely seen now. And for a while, there was fetal pulse ox, and that uh, was actually a pulse oximeter probe that you would place on the fetal cheek intrauterine. Um, unfortunately, they just didn't really work all that well and have now been pulled from the market. Um, never did really um, pan out, although probably they were abandoned before enough studies were done. Um, the newest technology is called STAN, ST analysis, um, and that involves putting a scalp electrode on the baby so that you can get the actual EKG, and then you look at the EKG and what it turns out is that by looking at the T wave compared to the R wave, and then also the shape of the T wave, a double hump or a biphasic T wave, um, that these things end up being correlated with an acidosis. And so you don't actually look at the EKG, it does the calculations itself, and it would take a already concerning tracing and then start putting little marks saying that this is even more concerning. And this turns out to be actually fairly accurate for predicting fetal acidosis. This is a relatively new technology. It has not taken hold. We don't have it in Gainesville. Um, but you may end up in a place that has the availability of that. So if you have a baby who is having late with decreased beat-to-beat -beat variability, we get worried about it. If you also have Stan that says they're acidotic, then, then you really are concerned. Um, an important thing for us is to understand the effects of our drugs, um, and the most important effect is opioids, and they will do three things. They will decrease variability, they will decrease the presence of accelerations, and they can cause the sinusoidal pattern. That doesn't mean the baby's in trouble, it just means that they got narcotics. Um, so in a patient who's already got a worrisome tracing, we will often try to avoid narcotics because the presence of variability is so reassuring. And if we knock it out, all we do is lose the monitor. We don't make the baby sick, but by eliminating the monitor, we raise concerns. So we try to avoid giving opioids, uh, IV, and even epidural fentanyl gets absorbed to a large extent and can cause some decrease in variability, so we may be cautious about that in a patient where there are concerns. Um, when we first started doing CSEs, uh, we were using fairly large doses of intrathecal sufentanil, and that was causing some fetal bradycardia. The actual mechanism is unclear, um, but uh, the current recommended dose is only 5 mics, and it doesn't appear to be a problem with 5 mics. 10 mics was definitely a problem. Even 7.5 micrograms was studied, and that was also a problem. So 5 mics is optimal. So the take-home message from fetal heart rate monitoring, electronic fetal heart rate monitoring, is understand what normal looks like. Understand what the baseline should be what normal beat-to-beat -beat variability looks like, that accelerations and variability are very reassuring. If you have those, your baby is not in dire straits, and if you have a patient with a bad airway, you should not be even considering doing a stat general section on a baby that looks that good for uh, concerns about the baby, at least. If you have a class 3 tracing, so absence of variability, presence of lates or deep variables repeatedly, or a sinusoidal rhythm, then you really do have a risk for a baby who's in trouble and proceeding with C-section is reasonable. That still doesn't mean that you take a lady with a bad airway and induce general anesthesia, but moving expediently toward delivery is very reasonable. Class two, which I didn't mention, is everything else, and those are the indeterminate. Um, we don't know whether the baby is acidotic. We don't know how much time there is to go on with the C-section. But given that, you should not feel pressured. If you think the patient would benefit from a spinal instead of a general, uh, your obstetrician uh, really doesn't have any evidence-based medicine to uh, push that, that uh, general is required for that C-section. And that's electronic fetal monitoring in a nutshell.